Okay, I think this works. I starfall that guy. Your face, 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 and bam! Gotcha! Alright. Nice. Get a nice win in there. Alright. All right, that was good. That was good. All right. Oh, wait. Shoot, I'm supposed to be... Oh. Dang it. Dang it, dang it, dang it. Hmm. Hi, software engineers. How's it going? Glad to have you with me this evening. Um... Sammy's not with me this time, um, much to many, many of your chagrin, hopefully, but um, I'm going to try that lecture again. <laughs> uh, the puppet show is great, but um, yeah, I didn't get much done right there. So how about I switch over to my browser window, do my lecture slides. Now let's talk about what I'm going to talk about tonight. So a little bit of clarification on sprint checks. I sent an email about this earlier today, but the quick version is um, your sprint checks can happen between like Monday and Wednesday, sometimes Thursday. I'd kind of like them a little bit earlier in the week if that works for you and the TAs. But the basic idea is that we're not confined to the lab per se, but you need to keep weekly progress. So I've set the due date for sprint reports to still be Monday, but the late deadline is Thursday. So just somewhere in there, as long as it's done before you meet with your TA, then that's fine. Okay, so as long as you do that before then, it's fine. Quiz three is due on Monday. If you are interested in still doing it, depending on what you're doing with the credit, no credit thing. Um, I actually haven't checked today, see how many are there, but please um, take a look if you are interested in doing that. And then let's give this shot uh, again on the lecture on design patterns. So. Let me actually now jump back over to the design patterns lecture slides. Do 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 do, and I screwed it up again. I need to like write down. This is what you do. Lecture slides present. There we go. Nice. All right. So. One thing I didn't mention last time because reasons was that we're actually out of the design portion of the class. We're actually in maintenance now. You might think that's kind of weird. We're talking about software design patterns. It's in the name. Well, the reason I put it here is two, two, two reasons. One, the design unit's kind of long. <laughs> so I decided to move this one to the next unit. But the other reason is because we talked about this with architectural design patterns. When the idea is communication, the idea is we're trying to tell other people what we're going to build. If we can use known techniques, known ideas, known patterns, then it's easier for other software developers to come in and make changes and update and maintain that software. So I decided moving design patterns software design patterns over to the maintenance section, it was fine. So what exactly is a pattern? Well, we talked about this in the context of architectural design patterns. A design pattern is a known solution to, is a, is a, is a working solution to a known problem. Um, so right here, I start with the description between framework and pattern. So Django is a framework, JUnit is a framework. Um, all those other uh, model view controller things that you looked up. Those are frameworks. What, what's a framework? Well, a framework is basically, I'm going to give you the scaffolding of the system and you go in and you fill in the code as you need to build it to do what you want it to do. So if you've built one Django system, you can probably figure out other Django systems because all the hooks are kind of in the same spot. The difference is you're just building a different piece of software. Well, how's that different than a pattern? Well, a pattern is much more abstract. A pattern is more generally applicable to a lot of things. A framework is a very concrete, here's some code that you're going to download, here's what you're going to do. But in, uh, in the idea of a pattern, it's more, this is an algorithmic challenge. This is a something we run into a lot when we're writing software. This is, a, a, this is the way we figured out how to solve it. 
So just like when we say that the concept of MVC is an architectural design pattern, Django is the framework. Django is the thing that you use to actually build the software, whereas the concept of model view controller, three-tier separation, that is the pattern. So for four patterns, there's actually a book. There's a book for everything, which is good. Let me go to the browser window view. This is called the Gang of Four book, the Design Patterns book. This is the book that people look to when we talk about design patterns. Does anyone actually read this book? No. Uh, it's a very, it's, it's the only book I own that has like four of those ribbons for like pay, marking pages because it's more of a reference book. And of course you can just Google anything now, which is fine. I, I did learn that Googling Gang of Four is weird because then you get like the English post-punk band and a political faction of four Chinese communist party officials. Like I, I didn't know when I was trying to find a picture. Um, but what we find inside the Gang of Four book is a list of... Scroll, 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 scroll of software design patterns, here they are. And these are the patterns that they talk about in this book. Um, we are not gonna do all of these patterns. I'm gonna do a selection of these patterns to kind of talk about what it means to have a software design pattern and how you use them and how you understand them. The basic idea is that if you come up across a problem, you're like, hmm, I wonder if someone's done this before. They probably have. And a good software engineer doesn't reinvent the wheel. A good software engineer is not one that's going to go out and try and, you know, rediscover how to build uh, al an algorithmic solution when we've got books that tell you how to do this. Now, inside of a, a design pattern, what do you find? You typically find some UML. So right here, this is the singleton UML uh, class diagram. That we're going to look at some code for in just a couple minutes. Um, you'll typically find some pseudo code usually here. It's giving you some actual Java. Uh, and then it talks about what are some uh, instances where you might use this pattern. So what you won't find in most design patterns is a library. Like here, install the abstract design, you know, install the observer pattern. No, that's not how it works. It's, this is the solution. It's, it's kind of like looking up the answer to a degree. Um, almost always design patterns of this type are intended to be simple, intended to be reused in many different languages. So there's a lot of generality to them. And it's always, it's not going to be like, this is the end all be all. If you're not using this exact design pattern, you're doing it wrong. No, it's, this is the one we think works the best. Okay. So bear that in mind when you're going through these patterns are half baked, meaning you always have to finish them yourself and adapt them to your own environment. Um, It's a template. It's an example. It's a recipe. It's, you know, whatever analogy you want to use, that's what they are. Now, in that Gang of Four book, uh, How Central Are the Idea of Patterns to Modern OO Development? Eric Gamma is the main author of the, the Gang of Four book. Um, he kind of wrote Eclipse and JUnit. Yeah. So he's done some things in software development. So it's a good place to look. When we're looking at design patterns, there's three main categories, creational, structural, and behavioral. Uh, creational patterns are talking about how you um, organize the code. Structural would be how do you make different pieces of code work together. Um, and then behavioral is, well, it's, it's more algorithmic. So for creational, we're going to look at singleton, and I'll do that one today. Structural, we're going to look at decorator. I'll do that one tomorrow. And also... Uh, Observer, we'll probably do that one tomorrow as well. Visitor, we'll probably talk about as well. These are very, very common patterns just to give you a sampling of it. But we're only going to do uh, the rest of Singleton today because we didn't really do it the other day. I did talk about the idea that global variables are bad and the idea that you don't want to have a, um, a variable that anything can change because that's not safe. Um, you could have race conditions. You can have it where someone changes the value and you didn't know what was going on. You, there's all sorts of reasons you shouldn't do it. We've all done it. I can think of many programs I've written for assignments when I was in school where I just, yeah, created a variable because, yeah, I needed it to work. But that's not a good way of doing it. 
So what if we needed that though? What if we needed that, but we can also put different types of protections around it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create one instance of, of a class, okay? And everything in the system that needs that class can interact with that one class object. So we're gonna make it accessible to everything by making it static. So the singleton pattern says you have one static variable called something like, in this case, the instance. The constructor is made private or protected. The clients call a public uh, operation called get the instance, which pulls that class in, and then you can construct the instance and then start using it. So I've got some example code here. Taha, we're gonna do some game stuff. Um, but let me actually pull up. Okay. So let's look at this code here. Um, so I've got, Open them both, you silly thing. Okay. Here is my singleton class, okay? So inside my singleton class, I have a constructor that just generates it, okay? But inside that, I have private static class singleton holder, private static final, create an instance of singleton. So there is inside of the class, um, of this class that I can instantiate anywhere in the system, a static variable, a static class that has an instance of the thing in it. I know it's kind of mind bending for a moment there, but then when you say get the instance, it returns this exact version of the class, the thing that has the value right here. Okay. Now here are my setters and getters. This allows me to put those protections around that variable. Like I mentioned. So how does this work in the example itself? Okay. Singleton create, you know, get the instance, get the instance. If the two things are equal, it should return same. Otherwise not same. If I say my singleton, get the value, now I'm gonna say my singleton two set the value, my singleton one get the value. Run, run without debugging. Okay, so what we get here is they are the same object. Make this a little bit bigger so we can see everything here. Okay, make it the same object. I'm gonna get the value. So I printed it, it starts off as zero, which we know, zero set it to four, and then I say my singleton one, print that value again, and it is four. So you might look at this and go, woo, Sheriff made a print line statement. Yeah, I know. But the basic idea here is, is I created a global variable that I was allowed to put protections around and it makes it safer to use. And I've ensured there's only one of these in the entire program at a time. So while it might seem kind of trivial to use it for this, where you really see this used is something like plugins for a plugin architecture. So for instance, in Firefox or Chrome, if you wanted to build a plugin to go into that system, it's possible you might need to call that plugin from a whole bunch of different tabs. And if you know anything about Firefox and Chrome, you know that each of the tabs runs in their own thread. They do that for safety reasons and also to take up every possible amount of resources on your computer as possible. But by doing a plugin architecture as a singleton, then if ever you need to access one password or ad block or whatever, it doesn't create seven different instances of ad block for each of your different pages. It just creates the one instance of the plugin and everything knows how to get in touch with it. So here's a great example of why singleton is a really, really interesting, powerful design pattern for something that's relatively simple. The idea of I only want one thing in the system. So there are a bunch of these design patterns um, and more are kind of created all the time. There's these traditional ones that we find in the Gang of Four book and those are the ones I'm gonna focus on for the next lecture at least. But the idea is these are known problems. These are known solutions. Um, when you go about trying to tackle some things, um, it's best to try and figure out, well, has this been done before? So some of the problems we're gonna tackle in the next videos are things like, um, let's say we wanna be able to um, have uh, something that sends data to a whole bunch of different places. Let's say there's a basketball game going on at JPJ. That sounds really sad to talk about that since there's not. But let's say for instance, we needed to send data from there to ESPN and CBS and Yahoo and who uses Yahoo? I don't know, but you get the idea. We need to send to a bunch of different places. This is called the observer pattern. What if you needed to build some code that knows how to traverse a tree? 
That's called the visitor pattern. There's a pattern for all of these different, very common things. And that's what we're gonna go through next. So if you have any questions, uh, uh, post on the Piazza thread. Hopefully you've seen them finally starting to get these posted a little bit better in my lecture notes, which is handy. So um, more on design patterns next time. Keep working on quiz number three. Quiz number four will come out on Monday. Uh, it's on the design stuff. Hope you're doing well. Miss seeing you guys as always. Stop by next time I uh, go stream Hearthstone as opposed to just a gag at the beginning. Bye.